Question 103 of Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, on the Divine Government. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, on the Divine Government, by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 103, of the Government of Things in General, in Eight Articles. Having considered the creation of things and their distinction, we now consider in the third place the government thereof, and, one, the government of things in general, two, in particular, the effects of this government. Under the first head there are eight points of inquiry. 1. Whether the world is governed by someone. 2. What is the end of this government? 3. Whether the world is governed by one. 4. Of the effects of this government. 5 whether all things are subject to divine government. 6. Whether all things are immediately governed by God. 7. Whether the divine government is frustrated in anything. 8. Whether anything is contrary to the divine providence. First article. Whether the world is governed by anyone. Objection 1. It would seem that the world is not governed by anyone, for it belongs to those things to be governed which move or work for an end. But natural things, which make up the greater part of the world, do not move or work for an end, for they have no knowledge of their end. Therefore, the world is not governed. Objection 2. Further, those things are governed which are moved towards an object. But the world does not appear to be so directed, but has stability in itself. Therefore, it is not governed. Objection 3. Further, what is necessarily determined by its own nature to one particular thing does not require any external principle of government. But the principal parts of the world are by a certain necessity determined to something particular in their actions and movements. Therefore the world does not require to be governed. On the contrary, it is written, in Wisdom 14.3, But thou, O Father, governest all things by thy providence. And Boethius says, in Consolation of Philosophy 3, Thou who governest this universe, by mandate eternal. I answer that certain ancient philosophers denied the government of the world, saying that all things happen by chance. But such an opinion can be refuted as impossible in two ways. First, by observation of things themselves. For we observe that in nature things happen always or nearly always for the best, which would not be the case unless some sort of providence directed nature toward good as an end, which is to govern. Wherefore, the unfailing order we observe in things is a sign of their being governed. For instance, if we enter a well-ordered house, we gather therefrom the intention of him that put it in order, as Tullius says on the nature of the gods too, quoting Aristotle's Cleanthes. Secondly, this is clear from a consideration of divine goodness, which, as we have said above, question 44, answer 4, question 65, answer 2, was the cause of the production of things in existence. For, as it belongs to the best to produce the best, it is not fitting that the supreme goodness of God should produce things without giving them their perfection. Now, a thing's ultimate perfection consists in the attainment of its end. Therefore, it belongs to the divine goodness, as it brought things into existence, so to lead them to their end. And this is to govern. Reply to Objection 1. A thing moves or operates for an end in two ways. First, in moving itself to the end, as man and other rational creatures, and such things have knowledge of their end, and of the means to the end. Secondly, a thing is said to move or operate for an end, as though moved or directed by another thereto, as an arrow directed to the target by the archer, who knows the end unknown to the arrow. Wherefore, as the movement of the arrow towards a definite end shows clearly that it is directed by someone with knowledge, so the unvarying course of natural things, which are without knowledge, shows clearly that the world is governed by some reason. Reply to Objection 2. In all created things there is a stable element, at least primary matter, and something belonging to movement, if under movement we include operation. And things need governing as to both, because even that which is stable, since it is created from nothing, would return to nothingness were it not sustained by a governing hand as will be explained later in question 4, answer 1. Reply to Objection 3. 
the natural necessity inherent in those beings which are determined to a particular thing is a kind of impression from god directing them to their end as the necessity whereby an arrow is moved so as to fly towards a certain point is an impression from the archer and not from the arrow but there is a difference inasmuch as that which creatures receive from god is their nature while that which natural things receive from man in addition to their nature is somewhat violent wherefore as the violent necessity in the movement of the arrow shows the action of the archer so the natural necessity of things shows the government of divine providence second article whether the end of the government of the world is something outside the world objection one it would seem that the end of the government of the world is not something existing outside the world for the end of the government of a thing is that whereto the thing governed is brought but that whereto a thing is brought is some good in the thing itself thus a sick man is brought back to health which is something good in him therefore the end of government of things is some good not outside but within the things themselves objection to further the philosopher says ethics one one some ends are an operation some are a work that is produced by an operation but nothing can be produced by the whole universe outside itself an operation exists in the agent therefore nothing extrinsic can be the end of the government of things objection three further the good of the multitude seems to consist in order and peace which is the tranquillity of order as augustine says city of god nineteen thirteen but the world is composed of a multitude of things therefore the end of the government of the world is, is the peaceful order of things in themselves therefore the end of the government of the world is not an extrinsic good on the contrary it is written proverbs sixteen four the lord hath made all things for himself but god is outside the entire order of the universe therefore the end of all things is something extrinsic to them i answer that as the end of a thing corresponds to its beginning it is not possible to be ignorant of the end of things if we know their beginning therefore since the beginning of all things is something outside the universe namely god it is clear from what has been expounded above question four answers one and two that we must conclude that the end of all things is some extrinsic good this can be proved by reason for it is clear that good has the nature of an end wherefore a particular end of anything consists in some particular good while the universal end of all things is the universal good which is good of itself by virtue of its essence which is the very essence of goodness whereas a particular good is good by participation now it is manifest that in the whole created universe there is not a good which is not such by participation wherefore that good which is the end of the whole universe must be a good outside the universe reply to objection one we may acquire some good in many ways first as a form existing in us such as health or knowledge secondly as something done by us as a builder attains his end by building a house thirdly as something good possessed or acquired by us as the buyer of a field attains his end when he enters into possession wherefore nothing prevents something outside the universe being the good to which it is directed reply to objection two the philosopher is speaking of the ends of various arts for the end of some arts consists in the operation itself as the end of a harpist is to play the harp whereas the end of other arts consists in something produced as the end of a builder is not the act of building but the house he builds now it may happen that something extrinsic is the end not only as made but also as possessed or acquired or even as represented as if we were to say that hercules is the end of the statue made to represent him therefore we may say that some good outside the whole universe is the end of the government of the universe as something possessed and represented for each thing tends to a participation thereof and to an assimilation thereto as far as is possible reply to objection three a good existing in the universe namely the order of the universe is an end thereof this however is not its ultimate end but is ordered to the extrinsic good as to the end thus the order in an army is ordered to the general as stated in metaphysics twelve didascali eleven ten third article whether the world is governed by one 
Objection 1. It would seem that the world is not governed by one. For we judge the cause by the effect. Now we see in the government of the universe that things are not moved and do not operate uniformly, but some contingently and some of necessity in variously different ways. Therefore the world is not governed by one. Objection 2. Further, things which are governed by one do not act against each other, except by the incapacity or unskillfulness of the ruler, which cannot apply to God. But created things agree not together and act against each other, as is evident in the case of contraries. Therefore the world is not governed by one. Objection 3. Further, in nature we always find what is the better. But it is better that two should be together than one. Ecclesiastes 4.9 Therefore, the world is not governed by one, but by many. On the contrary, we confess our belief in one God and one Lord, according to the words of the Apostle, 1 Corinthians 8.6. To us there is but one God, the Father, and one Lord. And both of these pertain to government. For to the Lord belongs dominion over subjects, and the name of God is taken by providence, as stated above. Question 13, answer 8. Therefore, the world is governed by one. I answer that we must of necessity say that the world is governed by one. For since the end of the government of the world is that which is essentially good, which is the greatest good, the government of the world must be the best kind of government. Now the best government is the government by one. The reason of this is that government is nothing but the directing of things governed to the end, which consists in some good. But unity belongs to the idea of goodness, as Boethius proves, Consolation of Philosophy 3.11, from this, that, as all things desire good, so do they desire unity, without which they would cease to exist. For a thing so far exists as it is one. Whence we observe that things resist division, as far as they can, and the dissolution of a thing arises from defect therein. Therefore the intention of a ruler over a multitude is unity, or peace. Now the proper cause of the unity is one. For it is clear that several cannot be the cause of unity or concord, except so far as they are united. Furthermore, what is one in itself is a more apt and a better cause of unity than several things united. Therefore a multitude is better governed by one than by several. From this it follows that the government of the world, being the best form of government, must be by one. This is expressed by the philosopher, Metaphysics 12, Didascali 11.10, Things refuse to be ill-governed, and multiplicity of authorities is a bad thing. Therefore, there should be one ruler. Reply to Objection 1. Movement is the act of a thing moved, caused by the mover. Wherefore, dissimilarity of movements is caused by a diversity of things moved, which diversity is essential to the perfection of the universe. Question 47, answers 1 and 2. Question 48, answer 2 and not by a diversity of governors. Reply to Objection 2. Although contraries do not agree with each other in their proximate ends, nevertheless they agree in the ultimate end, so far as they are included in the one order of the universe. Reply to Objection 3. If we consider individual goods, then two are better than one. But if we consider the essential good, then no addition is possible. Fourth Article whether the effect of government is one or many. Objection 1. It would seem that there is but one effect of the government of the world and not many. For the effect of government is that which is caused in the things governed. This is one, namely the good which consists in order, as may be seen in the example of an army. Therefore the government of the world has but one effect. Objection 2. Further, from one there naturally proceeds but one. But the world is governed by one as we have proved, answer 3, therefore also the effect of this government is but one. Objection 3. Further, if the effect of government is not one by reason of the unity of the governor, it must be many by reason of the many things governed. But these are too numerous to be counted, therefore we cannot assign any definite number to the effects of government. On the contrary, Dionysius says, divine names 12 god contains all and fills all by his providence and perfect goodness but government belongs to providence therefore there are certain definite effects of the divine government 
i answer that the effect of any action may be judged from its end because it is by action that the attainment of the end is effected now the end of the government of the world is the essential good to the participation and similarity of which all things tend consequently the effect of the government of the world may be taken in three ways first on the part of the end itself and in this way there is but one effect that is assimilation to the supreme good secondly the effect of the government of the world may be considered on the part of those things by means of which the creature is made like to god thus there are in general two effects of the government for the creature is assimilated to god in two things first with regard to this that god is good and so the creature becomes like him by being good and secondly with regard to this that god is the cause of goodness in others and so the creature becomes like god by moving others to be good wherefore there are two effects of government the preservation of things in their goodness and the moving of things to good thirdly we may consider in the individual the effects of the government of the world and in this way they are without number reply to objection one the order of the universe includes both the preservation of things created by god and their movement as regards these two things we find order among them inasmuch as one is better than another and one is moved by another from what has been said above we can gather the replies to the other two objections fifth article whether all things are subject to the divine government objection one it would seem that not all things are subject to the divine government for it is written ecclesiastes nine eleven i saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong nor bread to the wise nor riches to the learned nor favor to the skillful but time and chance in all but things subject to the divine government are not ruled by chance therefore those things which are under the sun are not subject to the divine government objection to further the apostle says 1 corinthians 9 9 god hath no care for oxen but he that governs has care for the things he governs therefore all things are not subject to the divine government objection three further what can govern itself needs not be governed by another but the rational creature can govern itself since it is master of its own act and acts of itself and is not made to act by another which seems proper to things which are governed therefore all things are not subject to the divine government on the contrary augustine says city of god 511 not only heaven and earth not only man and angel even the bowels of the lowest animal even the wing of the bird the flower of the plant the leaf of the tree hath God endowed with every fitting detail of their nature. Therefore all things are subject to his government. I answer that, for the same reason is God the ruler of things, as he is their cause, because the same gives existence as gives perfection, and this belongs to government. Now God is the cause not indeed only of some particular kind of being, but of the whole universal being, as proved above question forty four answers one and two wherefore as there can be nothing which is not created by god so there can be nothing which is not subject to his government this can also be proved from the nature of the end of government for a man's government extends over all those things which come under the end of his government now the end of the divine government is the divine goodness as we've shown answer two wherefore as there can be nothing that is not ordered to the divine goodness as its end as is clear from what we've said above, question 44, answer 4, question 65, answer 2, so it is impossible for anything to escape from the divine government. Foolish, therefore, was the opinion of those who said that the corruptible lower world were individual things, or that even human affairs were not subject to the divine government. These are represented as saying, God hath abandoned the earth, Ezekiel 9.9. 9. Reply to Objection 1. These things are said to be under the sun, which are generated and corrupted according to the sun's movement. In all such things we find chance, not that everything is casual which occurs in such things, but that in each one there is an element of chance. And the very fact that an element of chance is found in those things proves that they are subject to government of some kind. For unless corruptible things were governed by a higher being, they would tend to nothing definite, 
especially those which possess no kind of knowledge. So nothing would happen unintentionally, which constitutes the nature of chance. Wherefore, to show how things happen by chance, and yet according to the ordering of a higher cause, he does not say absolutely that he observes chance in all things, but time and chance, that is to say, that defects may be found in these things according to some order of time. Reply to Objection 2. Government implies a certain change effected by the governor in the things governed. Now every movement is the act of a movable thing, caused by the moving principle, as is laid down, Physics 3, three, And every act is proportionate to that of which it is an act. Consequently, various movable things must be moved variously, even as regards movement by one and the same mover. Thus by the one art of the divine governor, various things are variously governed according to their variety. Some, according to their nature, act of themselves, having dominion over their actions. And these are governed by God, not only in this, that they are moved by God himself, who works in them interiorly, but also in this, that they are induced by him to do good and to fly from evil, by precepts and prohibitions, rewards and punishments. But irrational creatures which do not act, but are acted upon, are not thus governed by God. Hence, when the Apostle says that God hath no care for oxen, he does not wholly withdraw them from the, the divine government, but only as regards the way in which rational creatures are governed. Reply to Objection 3. The rational creature governs itself by its intellect and will, both of which require to be governed and perfected by the divine intellect and will. Therefore, above the government whereby the rational creature governs itself as master of its own act, it requires to be governed by God. Sixth article, whether all things are immediately governed by God. Objection 1. It would seem that all things are governed by God immediately. For Gregory of Nyssa, Nemesius on human nature, reproves the opinion of Plato, who divides providence into three parts. The first he ascribes to the supreme God, who watches over heavenly things and all universals. The second providence he attributes to the secondary deities, who go the round of the heavens to watch over generation and corruption. While the third he ascribes a third providence to certain spirits who are guardians on earth of human actions. Therefore, it seems that all things are immediately governed by God. Objection 2. Further, it's better that a thing be done by one, if possible, than by many, as the philosopher says, Physics 8.6. But God can by himself govern all things without any intermediary cause. Therefore, it seems that he governs all things immediately. Objection 3. Further, in God nothing is defective or imperfect. But it seems to be imperfect in a ruler to govern by means of others. Thus an earthly king, by reason of his not being able to do everything himself, and because he cannot be everywhere at the same time, requires to govern by means of ministers. Therefore God governs all things immediately. On the contrary, Augustine says, on the Trinity 3.4, as the lower and grosser bodies are ruled in a certain orderly way by bodies of greater subtlety and power, so all bodies are ruled by the rational spirit of life, and the sinful and unfaithful spirit is ruled by the good and just spirit of life, and this spirit by God himself. I answer that in government there are two things to be considered, the design of government, which is providence itself, and the execution of the design. As to the design of government, God governs all things immediately, whereas in its execution, he governs some things by means of others. The reason of this is that as God is the very essence of goodness, so everything must be attributed to God in its highest degree of goodness. Now, the highest degree of goodness in any practical order, design, or knowledge, and such as the design of the government, consists in knowing the individuals acted upon as the best physician is not the one who can only give his attention to general principles, but who can consider the least details, and so on in other things. Therefore, we must say that God has the design of the government in all things, even of the very least. But since things which are governed should be brought to perfection by government, this government will be so much the better in the degree the things governed are brought to perfection. Now, it is a greater perfection for a thing to be good in itself and also the cause of goodness in others than only to be good in itself. Therefore, God so governs things that he makes some of them to be causes of others in government, as a master who not only imparts knowledge to his pupils, but gives also the faculty of teaching others. 
Reply to Objection 1. Plato's opinion is to be rejected, because he held that God did not govern all things immediately, even in the design of government. This is clear from the fact that he divided providence, which is the design of government, into three parts. Reply to Objection 2. If God governed alone, things would be deprived of the perfection of causality. Wherefore, all that is affected by many would not be accomplished by one. Reply to Objection 3. That an earthly king should have ministers to execute his laws is a sign not only of his being imperfect, but also of his dignity, because by the ordering of ministers the kingly power is brought into greater evidence. Seventh Article whether anything can happen outside the order of divine government. Objection 1. It would seem possible that something may occur outside the order of the divine government. For Boethius says, on the Consolation of Philosophy 3, that God disposes all for good. Therefore, if nothing happens outside the order of the divine government, it would follow that no evil exists. Objection 2. Further, nothing that is in accordance with the preordination of a ruler occurs by chance. Therefore, if nothing occurs outside the order of the divine government, it follows that there is nothing fortuitous and casual. Objection 3. Further, the order of divine providence is certain and unchangeable, because it is in accordance with the eternal design. Therefore, if nothing happens outside the order of the divine government, it follows that all things happen by necessity, and nothing is contingent, which is false. Therefore, it is possible for something to occur outside the order of the divine government. On the contrary, it is written, Esther 13.9, O Lord, Lord, Almighty King, all things are in thy power, and there is none that can resist thy will. I answer that it is possible for an effect to result outside the order of some particular cause, but not outside the order of the universal cause. The reason of this is that no effect results outside the order of a particular cause except through some other impeding cause, which other cause must itself be reduced to the first universal cause, as indigestion may occur outside the order of the nutritive power by some such impediment as the coarseness of the food, which again is to be ascribed to some other cause, and so on till we come to the first universal cause. Therefore, as God is the first universal cause, not of one genus only but of all being in general, it is impossible for anything to occur outside the order of the divine government. But from the very fact that from one point of view something seems to evade the order of divine providence considered in regard to one particular cause, it must necessarily come back to that order as regards some other cause. Reply to Objection 1. There is nothing wholly evil in the world, for evil is ever founded on good, as shown above. Question 48, answer 3. Therefore, something is said to be evil through its escaping from the order of some particular good. If it wholly escaped from the order of the divine government, it would wholly cease to exist. Reply to Objection 2. Things are said to be fortuitous as regards some particular cause from the order of which they escape. But as to the order of divine providence, nothing in the world happens by chance, as Augustine declares. 83 different questions. Question 24. Reply to Objection 3. Certain effects are said to be contingent as compared to their proximate causes, which may fail in their effects, and not as though anything could happen entirely outside the order of divine government. The very fact that something occurs outside the order of some proximate cause is owing to some other cause, itself subject to the divine government. Eighth Article. Whether anything can resist the order of the divine government. Objection 1. It would seem possible that some resistance can be made to the order of the divine government. For it is written, Isaiah 3, eight, Their tongue and their devices are against the Lord. Objection 2. Further, a king does not justly punish those who do not rebel against his commands. Therefore, if no one rebelled against God's commands, no one would be justly punished by God. Objection 3. Further, everything is subject to the order of the divine government but some things oppose others. Therefore, some things rebel against the order of the divine government. On the contrary, Boethius says, Consolation of Philosophy 3, There is nothing that can desire or is able to resist this sovereign good, 
It is this sovereign good, therefore, that ruleth all mightily and ordereth all sweetly, as is said, Wisdom 8 of Divine Wisdom. I answer that we may consider the order of divine providence in two ways. In general, inasmuch as it proceeds from the governing cause of all, and in particular, inasmuch as it proceeds from some particular cause which executes the order of the divine government. Considered in the first way, nothing can resist the order of the divine government. This can be proved in two ways. Firstly, from the fact that the order of the divine government is wholly directed to good, and everything by its own operation and effort tends to good only, for no one acts intending evil, as Dionysius says, divine names for. Secondly, from the fact that, as we've said above, answer 1, add 3, answer 5, add 2, every inclination of anything, whether natural or voluntary, is nothing but a kind of impression from the first mover, as the inclination of the arrow toward a fixed point is nothing but an impulse received from the archer. Wherefore, every agent, whether natural or free, attains to its divinely appointed end, as though of its own accord. For this reason God is said to order all things sweetly. Reply to Objection 1. Some are said to think or speak or act against God, not that they entirely resist the order of the divine government, for even the sinner intends the attainment of a certain good, but because they resist some particular good, which belongs to their nature or state. Therefore they are justly punished by God. Reply to Objection 2 is clear from the above. In Reply to Objection 3, from the fact that one thing opposes another, it follows that some one thing can resist the order of a particular cause, but not that order which depends on the universal cause of all things. End of Question 103Question 104 of Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, on the Divine Government. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, on the Divine Government, by St. Thomas Aquinas. Translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 104. The Special Effects of the Divine Government. In Four Articles. We next consider the effects of the divine government in particular, concerning which four points of inquiry arise. 1. Whether creatures need to be kept in existence by God. 2. Whether they are immediately preserved by God. 3. Whether God can reduce anything to nothingness. 4. Whether anything is reduced to nothingness. First Article Whether Creatures Need to Be Kept in Being by God Objection 1. It would seem that creatures do not need to be kept in being by God. For what cannot not be does not need to be kept in being, just as that which cannot depart does not need to be kept from departing. But some creatures by their very nature cannot not be. Therefore not all creatures need to be kept in being by God. The middle proposition is proved thus. That which is included in the nature of a thing is necessarily in that thing, and its contrary cannot be in it. Thus a multiple of two must necessarily be even, and cannot possibly be an odd number. Now form brings being with itself, because everything is actually in being, so far as it has form. But some creatures are subsistent forms, as we've said of the angels, question 50, answers 2 and 5, and thus to be is in them of themselves. The same reasoning applies to those creatures whose matter is in potentiality to one form only, as above explained of heavenly bodies. Question 66, answer 2. Therefore such creatures as these have in their nature to be necessarily, and cannot not be. For there can be no potentiality to not being, either in the form which has being of itself, or in matter existing under a form which it cannot lose, since it is not in potentiality to any other form. Objection 2. Further, God is more powerful than any created agent. But a created agent, even after ceasing to act, can cause its effect to be preserved in being. Thus the house continues to stand after the builder has ceased to build, and water remains hot for some time after the fire has ceased to heat. Much more, therefore, can God cause his creature to be kept in being, after he has ceased to create it. Objection 3. Further, 
Nothing violent can occur except there be some active cause thereof. But tendency to not being is unnatural and violent to any creature, since all creatures naturally desire to be. Therefore no creature can tend to not being, except through some active cause of corruption. Now there are creatures of such a nature that nothing can cause them to corrupt. Such are spiritual substances and heavenly bodies. Therefore, such creatures cannot tend to not being, even if God were to withdraw his action. Objection 4. Further, if God keeps creatures in being, this is done by some action. Now, every action of an agent, if that action be efficacious, produces something in the effect. Therefore, the preserving power of God must produce something in the creature. But this is not so, because this action does not give being to the creature, since being is not given to that which already is nor does it add anything new to the creature, because either God would not keep the creature in being continually, or he would be continually adding something new to the creature, either of which is unreasonable. Therefore, creatures are not kept in being by God. On the contrary, it is written, Hebrews 1.3, Upholding all things by the word of his power. I answer that both reason and faith bind us to say that creatures are kept in being by God. To make this clear, we must consider that a thing is preserved by another in two ways. First, indirectly and accidentally. Thus, a person is said to preserve anything by removing the cause of its corruption, as a man may be said to preserve a child whom he guards from falling into the fire. In this way, God preserves some things, but not all, for there are some things of such a nature that nothing can corrupt them so that it is not necessary to keep them from corruption. Secondly, a thing is said to preserve another per se and directly, namely, when what is preserved depends on the preserver in such a way that it cannot exist without it. In this manner, all creatures need to be preserved by God, for the being of every creature depends on God, so that not for a moment could it subsist, but would fall into nothingness were it not kept in being by the operation of the divine power, as Gregory says. In moral poems 16. This is made clear as follows. Every effect depends on its cause, so far as it is its cause. But we must observe that an agent may be the cause of the becoming of its effect, but not directly of its being. This may be seen both in artificial and in natural beings, for the builder causes the house in its becoming, but he is not the direct cause of its being, for it is clear that the being of the house is a result of its form which consists in the putting together and arrangement of the materials, and results from the natural qualities of certain things. Thus a cook dresses the food by applying the natural activity of fire, thus a builder constructs a house by making use of cement, stones, and wood which are able to be put together in a certain order and to preserve it. Therefore the being of a house depends on the nature of these materials, just as its becoming depends on the action of the builder. The same principle applies to natural things. For if an agent is not the cause of a form as such, neither will it be directly the cause of being which results from that form, but it will be the cause of the effect in its becoming only. Now, it is clear that of two things in the same species, one cannot directly cause the other's form as such, since it would then be the cause of its own form, which is essentially the same as the form of the other. But it can be the cause of this form for as much as it is in matter, in other words, it may be the cause that this matter receives this form. And this is to be the cause of becoming, as when man begets man and fire causes fire. Thus, whenever a natural effect is such that it has an aptitude to receive from its active cause an impression specifically the same as in that active cause, then the becoming of the effect, but not its being, depends on the agent. Sometimes, however, the effect has not this aptitude to receive the impression of its cause in the same way as it exists in the agent, as may be seen clearly in all agents which do not produce an effect of the same species as themselves. Thus the heavenly bodies cause the generation of inferior bodies which differ from them in species. Such an agent can be the cause of a form as such, and not merely as existing in this matter. Consequently, it is not merely the cause of becoming, but also the cause of being. Therefore, as the becoming of a thing cannot continue when that action of the agent ceases which causes the becoming of the effect, so neither can the being of a thing continue after that action of the agent has ceased, which is the cause of the effect not only in becoming, but also in being. This is why hot water retains heat after the cessation of the fire's action, 
while on the contrary the air does not continue to be lit up even for a moment when the sun ceases to act upon it because water is a matter susceptive of the fire's heat in the same way as it exists in the fire wherefore if it were to be reduced to the perfect form of fire it would retain that form always whereas if it has the form of fire imperfectly and inchoately the heat will remain for a time only by reason of the imperfect participation of the principle of heat on the other hand air is not of such a nature as to receive the light in the same way it is as it exists in the sun which is the principle of light therefore since it has not root in the air the light ceases with the action of the sun now every creature may be compared to god as the air is to the sun which enlightens it for as the sun possesses light by its nature and as the air is enlightened by sharing the sun's nature so god alone is being in virtue of his own essence since his essence is his existence whereas every creature has being by participation so that its essence is not its existence therefore as augustine says the literal meaning of genesis four twelve if the ruling power of god were withdrawn from his creatures their nature would at once cease and all nature would collapse in the same work in the literal meaning of genesis eight twelve he says as the air becomes light by the presence of the sun so is man enlightened by the presence of god and in his absence returns at once to darkness reply to objection one being naturally results from the form of a creature given the influence of the divine action just as light results from the diaphanous nature of the air given the action of the sun wherefore the potentiality to not being in spiritual creatures and heavenly bodies is rather something in god who can withdraw his influence than in the form or matter of those creatures reply to objection to god cannot grant to a creature to be preserved in being after the cessation of the divine influence as neither can he make it not to have received its being from himself for the creature needs to be preserved by god in so far as the being of an effect depends on the cause of its being so that there is no comparison with an agent that is not the cause of being but only of becoming reply to objection three this argument holds in regard to that preservation which consists in the removal of corruption but all creatures do not need to be preserved thus as stated above reply to objection four the preservation of things by god is a continuation of that action whereby he gives existence which action is without either motion or time so also the preservation of light in the air is by the continual influence of the sun second article whether god preserves every creature immediately objection one it would seem that god preserves every creature immediately for god creates and preserves things by the same action as above stated answer one at four but god created all things immediately therefore he preserves all things immediately objection two further a thing is nearer to itself than to another but it cannot be given to a creature to preserve itself much less therefore can it be given to a creature to preserve another therefore god preserves all things without any intermediate cause preserving them objection three further an effect is kept in being by the cause not only of its becoming but also of its being but all created causes do not seem to cause their effects except in their becoming for they cause only by moving as above stated question forty five answer three therefore they do not cause so as to keep their effects in being on the contrary a thing is kept in being by that which gives it being but god gives being by means of certain intermediate causes therefore he also keeps things in being by means of certain causes i answer that as stated above answer one a thing keeps another in being in two ways first indirectly and accidentally by removing or hindering the action of a corrupting cause secondly directly and per se by the fact that on it depends the other's being as the be being of the effect depends on the cause and in both ways a created thing keeps another in being for it is clear that even in corporeal beings there are many causes which hinder the action of corrupting agents and for that reason are called preservatives just as salt preserves meat from putrefaction and in like manner with many other things it happens also that an effect depends on a creature as to its being for when we have a series of causes depending on one another it necessarily follows that while the effect depends first and principally on the first cause 
It also depends in a secondary way on all the middle causes. Therefore the first cause is the principal cause of the preservation of the effect which is to be referred to the middle causes in a secondary way, and all the more so as the middle cause is higher and nearer to the first cause. For this reason, even in things corporeal, the preservation and continuation of things is ascribed to the higher causes. Thus the philosopher says in Metaphysics 12, Didascale 11, 6, that the first, namely the diurnal movement, is the cause of the continuation of things generated, whereas the second movement, which is from the zodiac, is the cause of diversity owing to generation and corruption. In like manner, astrologers ascribe to Saturn, the highest of the planets, those things which are permanent and fixed. So we conclude that God keeps certain things in being by means of certain causes. Reply to Objection 1. God created all things immediately, but in the creation itself he established an order among things, so that some depend on others, by which they are preserved in being, though he remains the principal cause of their preservation. Reply to Objection 2. Since an effect is preserved by its proper cause on which it depends, just as no effect can be its own cause but can only produce another effect, so no effect can be endowed with the power of self-preservation, but only with the power of preserving another. Reply to Objection 3. No created nature can be the cause of another, as regards the latter acquiring a new form or disposition, except by virtue of some change, for the created nature acts always on something presupposed. But after causing the form or disposition in the effect, without any fresh change in the effect, the cause preserves that form or disposition, as in the air when it is lit up anew, we must allow some change to have taken place, while the preservation of the light is without any further change in the air due to the presence of the source of light. Third article. Whether God can annihilate anything. Objection 1. It would seem that God cannot annihilate anything. For Augustine says, questions 83, 21, that God is not the cause of anything tending to non-existence. But he would be such a cause if he were to annihilate anything. Therefore, he cannot annihilate anything. Objection 2. Further, by his goodness, God is the cause why things exist, since, as Augustine says in On Christian Teaching 132, because God is good, we exist. But God cannot cease to be good. Therefore, he cannot cause things to cease to exist, which would be the case were he to annihilate anything. Objection 3. Further, if God were to annihilate anything, it would be by his action. But this cannot be, because the term of every action is existence. Hence, even the action of a corrupting cause has its term in something generated. For when one thing is generated, another undergoes corruption. Therefore, God cannot annihilate anything. On the contrary, it is written in Jeremiah 10.24, Correct me, O Lord, but yet with judgment, and not in thy fury, lest thou bring me to nothing. I answer that some have held that God, in giving existence to creatures, acted from a natural necessity. Were this true, God could not annihilate anything, since his nature cannot change. But, as we've said above, question 19, answer 4, such an opinion is entirely false, and absolutely contrary to the Catholic faith, which confesses that God created things of his own free will, according to Psalm 134, 6. Whatever the Lord pleased, he hath done. Therefore, that God gives existence to a creature depends on his will, nor does he preserve things in existence otherwise than by continually pouring out existence into them, as we've said. Therefore, just as before things existed, God was free not to give them existence, and not to make them. So after they are made, he is free not to continue their existence, and thus they would cease to exist, and this would be to annihilate them. Reply to Objection 1. Non-existence has no direct cause, for nothing is a cause except inasmuch as it has existence, and a being essentially as such is a cause of something existing. Therefore, God cannot cause a thing to tend to non-existence, whereas a creature has this tendency of itself, since it is produced from nothing. But indirectly, God can be the cause of things being reduced to non-existence by withdrawing his action therefrom. Reply to Objection 2. God's goodness is the cause of things, not as though by natural necessity, because the divine goodness does not depend on creatures, 
but by his free will. Wherefore, as without prejudice to his goodness, he might not have produced things into existence, so without prejudice to his goodness, he might not preserve things in existence. Reply to Objection 3. If God were to annihilate anything, this would not imply an action on God's part, but a mere cessation of his action. Fourth article. Whether anything is annihilated. Objection 1. It would seem that something is annihilated, for the end corresponds to the beginning. But in the beginning there was nothing but God. Therefore all things must tend to this end, that there shall be nothing but God. Therefore creatures will be reduced to nothing. Objection 2. Further, every creature has a finite power, but no finite power extends to the infinite. Wherefore the philosopher proves, in Physics 8, 10, that a finite power cannot move in infinite time. Therefore a creature cannot last for an infinite duration, and so at some time it will be reduced to nothing. Objection 3. Further, forms and accidents have no matter as part of themselves, but at some time they cease to exist, therefore they are reduced to nothing. On the contrary, it is written, Ecclesiastes 3.14, I have learned that all the works that God hath made continue forever. I answer that some of those things which God does in creatures occur in accordance with the natural course of things. Others happen miraculously, and not in accordance with the natural order, as will be explained in question 105, answer 6. Now whatever God wills to do according to the natural order of things may be observed from their nature. But those things which occur miraculously are ordered for the manifestation of grace, according to the Apostle, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit unto profit, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. And subsequently he mentions, among others, the working of miracles. Now, the nature of creatures shows that none of them is annihilated. For either they are immaterial and therefore have no potentiality to non-existence, or they are material and then they continue to exist at least in matter which is incorruptible, since it is the subject of generation and corruption. Moreover, the annihilation of things does not pertain to the manifestation of grace, since rather the power and goodness of God are manifested by the preservation of things in existence. Wherefore, we must conclude by denying absolutely that anything at all will be annihilated. Reply to Objection 1. That things are brought into existence from a state of non-existence clearly shows the power of Him who made them, but that they should be reduced to nothing would hinder that manifestation, since the power of God is conspicuously shown in His preserving all things in existence, according to the Apostle, upholding all things by the word of His power. Hebrews 1.3 Reply to Objection 2. A creature's potentiality to existence is merely receptive. The active power belongs to God Himself, from whom existence is derived. Wherefore, the infinite duration of things is a consequence of the infinity of the divine power. To some things, however, is given a determinate power of duration for a certain time, so far as they may be hindered by some contrary agent from receiving the influx of existence which comes from him whom finite power cannot resist, for an infinite, but only for a fixed time. So things which have no contrary, although they have a finite power, continue to exist forever. Reply to Objection 3. Forms and accidents are not complete beings, since they do not subsist but each one of them is something of a being, for it is called a being, because something is by it. Yet so far as their mode of existence is concerned, they are not entirely reduced to nothingness, not that any part of them survives, but that they remain in the potentiality of the matter, or of the subject. End of question 104. Question 105 of Summa Theologica, Pars Prima on the divine government. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, on the divine government, by St. Thomas Aquinas, translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 105, of the change of creatures by God, in eight articles. We now consider the second effect of the divine government, that is, the change of creatures, and first, the change of creatures by God, secondly, 
the change of one creature by another. Under the first head, there are eight points of inquiry. 1. Whether God can move immediately the matter to the form. 2. Whether he can immediately move a body. 3. Whether he can move the intellect. 4. Whether he can move the will. 5. Whether God works in every worker. 6. Whether he can do anything outside the order imposed on things. 7. Whether all that God does is miraculous. 8. Of the diversity of miracles. First article. Whether God can move the matter immediately to the form. Objection 1. It would seem that God cannot move the matter immediately to receive the form. For as the philosopher proves in Metaphysics 7, Didascale 6, 8, nothing can bring form into any particular matter, except that form which is in matter, because like begets like. But God is not a form in matter, therefore he cannot cause a form in matter. Objection 2. Further, any agent inclined to several effects will produce none of them unless it is determined to a particular one by some other cause. For as the philosopher says, on the soul 3.11, a general assertion does not move the mind except by means of some particular apprehension. But the divine power is the universal cause of all things. Therefore it cannot produce any particular form except by means of a particular agent. Objection 3. As universal being depends on the first universal cause, so determinate being depends on determinate particular causes, as we have seen above in question 104, answer 2. But the determinate being of a particular thing is from its own form. Therefore, the forms of things are produced by God only by means of particular causes. On the contrary, it is written, Genesis 2.7, God formed man of the slime of the earth. I answer that. God can move matter immediately to form, because whatever is in passive potentiality can be reduced to act by the active power which extends over that potentiality. Therefore, since the divine power extends over matter, as produced by God, it can be reduced to act by the divine power. And this is what is meant by matter being moved to a form, for a form is nothing else but the act of matter. Reply to Objection 1. An effect is assimilated to the act of cause in two ways. First, according to the same species, as man is generated by man and fire by fire. Secondly, by being virtually contained in the cause, as the form of the effect is virtually contained in its cause, thus animals produced by putrefaction and plants and minerals are like the sun and stars, by whose power they are produced. In this way the effect is like its active cause as regards all that over which the power of that cause extends. Now, the power of God extends to both matter and form, as we've said above, question 14, answer 2, question 44, answer 2. Wherefore, if a composite thing be produced, it is likened to God by way of a virtual inclusion, or it is likened to the composite generator by a likeness of species. Therefore, just as the composite generator can move matter to a form by generating a composite thing like itself, so also can God. But no other form not existing in matter can do this, because the power of no other separate substance extends over matter. Hence angels and demons operate on visible matter not by imprinting forms in matter, but by making use of corporeal seeds. Reply to Objection 2. This argument would hold if God were to act of natural necessity. But since he acts by his will and intellect, which knows the particular and not only the universal natures of all forms, it follows that he can determinately imprint this or that form on matter. Reply to Objection 3. The fact that secondary causes are ordered to determinate effects is due to God. Wherefore, since God ordains other causes to certain effects, he can also produce certain effects by himself, without any other cause. Second article. Whether God can move a body immediately. Objection 1. It would seem that God cannot move a body immediately. For as the mover and the moved must exist simultaneously, as the philosopher says, Physics 7, 2, it follows that there must be some contact between the mover and the moved. But there can be no contact between God and a body. For Dionysius says, in Divine Names 1, there is no contact with God. 
Therefore, God cannot move a body immediately. Objection 2. Further, God is the mover unmoved. But such also is the desirable object when apprehended. Therefore, God moves as the object of desire and apprehension. But he cannot be apprehended except by the intellect, which is neither a body nor a corporeal power. Therefore, God cannot move a body immediately. Objection 3. Further, the philosopher proves, Physics 8.10, that an infinite power moves instantaneously. But it is impossible for a body to be moved in one instant, for since every movement is between opposites, it follows that two opposites would exist at once in the same subject, which is impossible. Therefore, a body cannot be moved immediately by an infinite power. But God's power is infinite, as we have explained in question 25, answer 2. Therefore, God cannot move a body immediately. On the contrary, God produced the works of the six days immediately, among which is included the movements of bodies, as is clear from Genesis 1.9, let the waters be gathered together into one place. Therefore, God alone can move a body immediately. I answer that, it is erroneous to say that God cannot himself produce all the determinate effects which are produced by any created cause. Wherefore, since bodies are moved immediately by created causes, we cannot possibly doubt that God can move immediately any bodies whatever. This indeed follows from what is above stated in answer 1. For every movement of any body whatever either results from a form, as the movements of things heavy and light result from the form which they have from their generating cause, for which reason the generator is called the mover, or else tends to a form, as heating tends to the form of heat. Now it belongs to the same cause to imprint a form, to dispose to that form, and to give the movement which results from that form. For fire not only generates fire, but it also heats and moves things upwards. Therefore, as God can imprint form immediately in matter, it follows that he can move any body whatever in respect of any movement whatever. Reply to Objection 1. There are two kinds of contact, corporeal contact, when two bodies touch each other, and virtual contact, as the cause of sadness is said to touch the one made sad. According to the first kind of contact, God, as being incorporeal, neither touches nor is touched. But according to virtual contact, he touches creatures by moving them. But he is not touched, because the natural power of no creature can reach up to him. Thus did Dionysius understand the words, there is no contact with God. That is, so that God himself be touched. Reply to Objection 2. God moves as the object of desire and apprehension, but it does not follow that he always moves as being desired and apprehended by that which is moved, but as being desired and known by himself, for he does all things for his own goodness. Reply to Objection 3. The philosopher, in Physics 8.10, intends to prove that the power of the first mover is not a power of the first mover of bulk by the following argument. The power of the first mover is infinite, which he proves from the fact that the first mover can move in infinite time. Now, an infinite power, if it were a power of bulk, would move without time, which is impossible. Therefore, the infinite power of the first mover must be in something which is not measured by its bulk. Whence it is clear that for a body to be moved without time can only be the result of an infinite power. The reason is that every power of bulk moves in its entirety, since it moves by the necessity of its nature. But an infinite power surpasses out of all proportion any finite power. Now the greater the power of the mover, the greater is the velocity of the movement. Therefore, since a finite power moves in a determinate time, it follows that an infinite power does not move in any time, for between one time and any other time there is some proportion. On the other hand, a power which is not in bulk is the power of an intelligent being, which operates in its effects according to what is fitting for them. And therefore, since it cannot be fitting for a body to be moved without time, it does not follow that it moves without time. Third article, whether God moves the created intellect immediately. Objection 1. It would seem that God does not immediately move the created intellect. For the action of the intellect is governed by its own subject, 
since it does not pass into external matter, as stated in Metaphysics 9, Didascale 8, 8. But the action of what is moved by another does not proceed from that wherein it is, but from the mover. Therefore the intellect is not moved by another, and so apparently God cannot move the created intellect. Objection 2. Further, anything which in itself is a sufficient principle of movement is not moved by another. But the movement of the intellect is its act of understanding, in the sense in which we say that to understand or to feel is a kind of movement, as the philosopher says in On the Soul 3.7. But the intellectual light which is natural to the soul is a sufficient principle of understanding. Therefore, it is not moved by another. Objection 3. Further, as the senses are moved by the sensible, so the intellect is moved by the intelligible. But God is not intelligible to us, and exceeds the capacity of our intellect. Therefore, God cannot move our intellect. On the contrary, the teacher moves the intellect of the one taught. But it is written, Psalm 93.10, that God teaches man knowledge. Therefore, God moves the human intellect. I answer that as in corporeal movement that is called the mover which gives the form that is the principle of movement, so that is said to move the intellect which is the cause of the form that is the principle of the intellectual operation, called the movement of the intellect. Now, there is a twofold principle of intellectual operation in the intelligent being, one which is the intellectual power itself, which principle exists in the one who understands in potentiality, while the other is the principle of actual understanding, namely, the likeness of the thing understood in the one who understands. So a thing is said to move the intellect, whether it gives to him who understands the power of understanding, or impresses on him the likeness of the thing understood. Now God moves the created intellect in both ways, for he is the first immaterial being, and as intellectuality is a result of immateriality, it follows that he is the first intelligent being. Therefore, since in each order the first is the cause of all that follows, we must conclude that from him proceeds all intellectual power. In like manner, since he is the first being, and all other beings pre-exist in him as in their first cause, it follows that they exist intelligibly in him, after the mode of his own nature. For as the intelligible types of everything must exist first of all in God, and are derived from him by other intellects in order that these may actually understand, so also are they derived by creatures that they may subsist. Therefore, God so moves the created intellect inasmuch as he gives it the intellectual power, whether natural or superadded, and impresses on the created intellect the intelligible species, and maintains and preserves both power and species in existence. Reply to Objection 1. The intellectual operation is performed by the intellect in which it exists as by a secondary cause, but it proceeds from God as from its first cause. For by him the power to understand is given to the one who understands. Reply to Objection 2. The intellectual light together with the likeness of the thing understood is a sufficient principle of the understanding, but it is a secondary principle and depends upon the first principle. Reply to Objection 3. The intelligible object moves our human intellect, so far as, in a way, it impresses on it its own likeness, by means of which the intellect is able to understand it. But the likenesses which God impresses on the created intellect are not sufficient to enable the created intellect to understand him through his essence, as we have seen above, question 12, answer 2, question 56, answer 3. Hence, he moves the created intellect, and yet he cannot be intelligible to it, as we have explained. In question 12, answer 4. Fourth article. Whether God can move the created will. Objection 1. It would seem that God cannot move the created will. For whatever is moved from without is forced. But the will cannot be forced, therefore it is not moved from without, and therefore cannot be moved by God. Objection 2. Further, God cannot make two contradictories to be true at the same time. But this would follow if he moved the will, for to be voluntarily moved means to be moved from within and not by another. Therefore, God cannot move the will. Objection 3. 
Further, movement is attributed to the mover rather than to the one moved. Wherefore, homicide is not ascribed to the stone, but to the thrower. Therefore, if God moves the will, it follows that voluntary actions are not imputed to man for reward or blame. But this is false. Therefore, God does not move the will. On the contrary, it is written, Philemon 2.13, It is God who worketh in us, Vulgate you, both to will and to accomplish. I answer that, as the intellect is moved by the object and by the giver of the power of intelligence, as stated above in answer 3, so is the will moved by its object, which is good, and by him who creates the power of willing. Now the will can be moved by good as its object, but by God alone sufficiently and efficaciously. For nothing can move a movable thing sufficiently unless the active power of the mover surpasses or at least equals the potentiality of the thing movable. Now the potentiality of the will extends to the universal good, for its object is the universal good, just as the object of the intellect is the universal being. But every created good is some particular good. God alone is the universal good whereas he alone fills the capacity of the will and moves it sufficiently as its object. In like manner, the power of willing is caused by God alone, for to will is nothing but to be inclined toward the object of the will, which is universal good. But to incline toward the universal good belongs to the first mover, to whom the ultimate end is proportionate, just as in human affairs to him that presides over the community belongs the directing of his subjects to the common weal. Wherefore, in both ways, it belongs to God to move the will, but especially in the second way, by an interior inclination of the will. Reply to Objection 1. A thing moved by another is forced if moved against its natural inclination, but if it is moved by another giving to it the proper natural inclination, it is not forced, as when a heavy body is made to move downward by that which produced it, then it is not forced. In like manner, God while moving the will, does not force it, because he gives the will its own natural inclination. Reply to Objection 2. To be moved voluntarily is to be moved from within, that is, by an interior principle. Yet this interior principle may be caused by an exterior principle, and so to be moved from within is not repugnant to being moved by another. Reply to Objection 3. If the will were so moved by another as in no way to be moved from within itself, the act of the will would not be imputed for reward or blame. But since its being moved by another does not prevent its being moved from within itself, as we have stated, add to, it does not thereby forfeit the motive for merit or demerit. Fifth article. Whether God works in every agent. Objection 1. It would seem that God does not work in every agent, for we must not attribute any insufficiency to God. If therefore God works in every agent, he works sufficiently in each one. Hence it would be superfluous for the created agent to work at all. Objection 2. Further, the same work cannot proceed at the same time from two sources, as neither can one and the same movement belong to two movable things. Therefore, if the creature's operation is from God operating in the creature, it cannot at the same time proceed from the same creature, and so no creature works at all. Objection 3. Further, the maker is the cause of the operation of the thing made, as giving it the form whereby it operates. Therefore, if God is the cause of the operation of things made by him, this would be inasmuch as he gives them the power of operating. But this is in the beginning when he makes them. Thus it seems that God does not operate any further in the operating creature. On the contrary, it is written, Isaiah 26.12, Lord, thou hast wrought all our works in, Vulgate, for us. I answer, that some have understood God to work in every agent in such a way that no created power has any effect in things, but that God alone is the ultimate cause of everything wrought. For instance, it is not fire that gives heat, but God in the fire, and so forth. But this is impossible. First, because the order of cause and effect would be taken away from created things, and this would imply lack of power in the Creator. For it is due to the power of the cause 
that it bestows active power on its effect. Secondly, because the active powers which are seen to exist in things would be bestowed on things to no purpose, if these wrought nothing through them. Indeed, all things created would seem in a way to be purposeless if they lacked an operation proper to them, since the purpose of everything is its operation. For the less perfect is always for the sake of the more perfect, and consequently, as the matter is for the sake of the form, so the form, which is the first act, is for the sake of its operation, which is the second act. And thus operation is the end of the creature. We must therefore understand that God works in things in such a manner that things have their proper operation. In order to make this clear, we must observe that as there are few kinds of causes, matter is not a principle of action, but is the subject that receives the effect of the action. On the other hand, the end, the agent, and the form are principles of action, but in a certain order. For the first principle of action is the end which moves the agent, the second is the agent. The third is the form of that which the agent applies to action, although the agent also acts through its own form, as may be clearly seen in things made by art. For the craftsman is moved to action by the end, which is the thing wrought, for instance, a chest or a bed, and applies to action the axe, which cuts through its being sharp. Thus, then, does God work in every worker, according to these three things, first as an end, for since every operation is for the sake of some good, real or apparent, and nothing is good either really or apparently, except in as far as it participates in a likeness to the supreme good, which is God, it follows that God himself is the cause of every operation as its end. Again, it is to be observed that where there are several agents in order, the second always acts in virtue of the first the first agent moves the second to act, and thus all agents act in virtue of God himself, and therefore he is the cause of action in every agent. Thirdly, we must observe that God not only moves things to operate, as it were applying their forms and powers to operation, just as the workman applies the axe to cut, who nevertheless at times does not give the axe its form, but he also gives created agents their forms and preserves them in being. Therefore he is the cause of action, not only by giving the form which is the principle of action, as the generator is said to be the cause of movement in things heavy and light, but also as preserving the forms and powers of things, just as the sun is said to be the cause of the manifestation of colors, inasmuch as it gives and preserves the light by which colors are made manifest. And since the form of a thing is within the thing, and all the more as it approaches nearer to the first and universal cause, and because in all things God himself is properly the cause of universal being, which is innermost in all things, it follows that in all things God works intimately. For this reason, in Holy Scripture, the operations of nature are attributed to God as operating in nature, according to Job 10.11. Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh. Thou hast put me together with bones and sinews. Reply to Objection 1. God works sufficiently in things as first agent, but it does not follow from this that the operation of secondary agents is superfluous. Reply to Objection 2. One action does not proceed from two agents of the same order, but nothing hinders the same action from proceeding from a primary and a secondary agent. Reply to Objection 3. God not only gives things their form, but he also preserves them in existence, and applies them to act, and is moreover at the end of every action, as above explained. Sixth article. Whether God can do anything outside the established order of nature. Objection 1. It would seem that God cannot do anything outside the established order of nature, for Augustine, against Faustus Amaniche, 26.3, says, God, the maker and creator of each nature, does nothing against nature. But that which is outside the natural order seems to be against nature. Therefore, God can do nothing outside the natural order. Objection 2. Further, as the order of justice is from God, so is the order of nature. But God cannot do anything outside the order of justice, for then he would do something unjust. Therefore, he cannot do anything outside the order of nature. Objection 3. Further, God established the order of nature. Therefore, 
If God does anything outside the order of nature, it would seem that He is changeable, which cannot be said. On the contrary, Augustine says, against Faustus and Manichae 26.3, God sometimes does things which are contrary to the ordinary course of nature. I answer that from each cause there results a certain order to its effects, since every cause is a principle. And so, according to the multiplicity of causes, there results a multiplicity of orders, subjected one to the other, as cause is subjected to cause. Wherefore, a higher cause is not subjected to a cause of a lower order, but conversely. An example of this might be seen in human affairs. On the father of a family depends the order of the household, which order is contained in the order of the city, which order again depends on the ruler of the city, while this last order depends on that of the king, by whom the whole kingdom is ordered. If, therefore, we consider the order of things depending on the first cause, God cannot do anything against this order, for if he did so, he would act against his foreknowledge, or his will, or his goodness. But if we consider the order of things depending on any secondary cause, thus God can do something outside such order. For he is not subject to the order of secondary causes, but, on the contrary, this order is subject to him, as proceeding from him, not by natural necessity, but by the choice of his own will. For he could have created another order of things, for instance, by producing the effects of secondary causes without them, or by producing certain effects to which secondary causes do not extend. So, Augustine says, against Faustus and Manichae 26.3, God acts against the wanted course of nature, but by no means does he act against the supreme law, for he does not act against himself. Reply to Objection 1. In natural things, something may happen outside this natural order in two ways. It may happen by the action of an agent which did not give them their natural inclination, as, for example, when a man moves a heavy body upwards, which does not owe to him its natural inclination to move downwards, and that would be against nature. It may also happen by the action of the agent on whom the natural inclination depends, and this is not against nature as is clear in the ebb and flow of the tide which is not against nature. Although it is against the natural movement of water in a downward direction, for it's owing to the influence of a heavenly body on which the natural inclination of lower bodies depends. Therefore, since the order of nature is given to things by God, if he does anything outside this order, it is not against nature. Wherefore, Augustine says, against Faustus and Manichae 26.3, That is natural to each thing, which is caused by him from whom is all mode, number, and order in nature. Reply to Objection 2. The order of justice arises by relation to the first cause, who is the rule of all justice, and therefore God can do nothing against such order. Reply to Objection 3. God fixed a certain order in things in such a way that at the same time he reserved to himself whatever he intended to do otherwise than by a particular cause. So when he acts outside this order, he does not change. Seventh article. Whether whatever God does outside the natural order is miraculous. Objection 1. It would seem that not everything which God does outside the natural order of things is miraculous. For the creation of the world and of souls and the justification of the unrighteous are done by God outside the natural order as not being accomplished by the action of any natural cause, yet these things are not called miracles. Therefore, not everything that God does outside the natural order is a miracle. Objection 2. Further, a miracle is something difficult, which seldom occurs, surpassing the faculty of nature, and going so far beyond our hopes as to compel our astonishment, as said St. Augustine on the Prophet of Believing 16. But some things outside the order of nature are not arduous, for they occur in small things, such as the recovery and healing of the sick. Nor are they of rare occurrence, since they happen frequently, as when the sick were placed in the streets to be healed by the shadow of Peter, in Acts 5.15. Nor do they surpass the faculty of nature, as when people are cured of a fever. Nor are they beyond our hopes, since we all hope for the resurrection of the dead, which nevertheless will be outside the course of nature. Therefore, not all things outside the course of nature are miraculous. Objection 3. Further, the word miracle is derived from admiration, 
Now admiration concerns things manifest to the senses, but sometimes things happen outside the order of nature, which are not manifest to the senses, as when the apostles were endowed with knowledge without studying or being taught. Therefore not everything that occurs outside the order of nature is miraculous. On the contrary, Augustine says, against Faustus and Manichae, 26.3, where God does anything against that order of nature which we know and are accustomed to observe, we call it a miracle. I answer that the word miracle is derived from admiration, which arises when an effect is manifest whereas its cause is hidden, as when a man sees an eclipse without knowing its cause, as the philosopher says in the beginning of his metaphysics. Now the cause of a manifest effect may be known to one, but unknown to others. Wherefore a thing is wonderful to one man, and not at all to others, as an eclipse is to a rustic, but not to an astronomer. Now a miracle is so called as being full of wonder, as having a cause absolutely hidden from all, and this cause is God. Wherefore those things which God does outside those causes which we know are called miracles. Reply to Objection 1. Creation and the justification of the unrighteous though done by God alone, are not, properly speaking, miracles, because they are not of a nature to proceed from any other cause, so they do not occur outside the order of nature, since they do not belong to that, that order. Reply to Objection 2. An arduous thing is called a miracle, not on account of the excellence of the thing wherein it is done, but because it surpasses the faculty of nature. Likewise, the thing is called unusual, not because it does not often happen, but because it is outside the usual natural course of things. Furthermore, a thing is said to be above the faculty of nature, not only by reason of the substance of the thing done, but also on account of the manner and order in which it is done. Again, a miracle is said to go beyond the hope of nature, not above the hope of grace, which hope comes from faith, whereby we believe in the future resurrection. Reply to Objection 3. The knowledge of the apostles, although not manifest in itself, yet was made manifest in its effect, from which it was shown to be wonderful. Eighth Article. Whether one miracle is greater than another. Objection 1. It would seem that one miracle is not greater than another. For Augustine says, Epistle to Volusinus 137, In miraculous deeds... The whole measure of the deed is the power of the doer. But by the same power of God, all miracles are done. Therefore, one miracle is not greater than another. Objection 2. Further, the power of God is infinite. But the infinite exceeds the finite beyond all proportion. And therefore, no more reason exists to wonder at one effect thereof than another. Therefore, one miracle is not greater than another. On the contrary, the Lord says, speaking of miraculous works in John 14.12, The works that I do, he also shall do, and greater than these shall he do. I answer that nothing is called a miracle by comparison with the divine power, because no action is of any account compared with the power of God, according to Isaiah 40.15. Behold, the Gentiles are as a drop from a bucket, and are counted as the smallest grain of a balance. But a thing is called a miracle by comparison with the power of nature which it surpasses. So the more the power of nature is surpassed, the greater the miracle. Now the power of nature is surpassed in three ways. Firstly, in the substance of the deed, for instance, if two bodies occupy the same place, or if the sun goes backwards, or if a human body is glorified, such things nature is absolutely unable to do, and these hold the highest rank among miracles. Secondly, a thing surpasses the power of nature not in the deed, but in that wherein it is done, as the raising of the dead, giving sight to the blind, and the like. For nature can give life, but not to the dead, and such hold the second rank in miracles. Thirdly, a thing surpasses nature's power in the measure and order in which it is done, as when a man is cured of a fever suddenly, without treatment or by the usual process of nature, or as when the air is suddenly condensed into rain by divine power without a natural cause, as occurred at the prayers of Samuel and Elias, and these hold the lowest place in miracles. Moreover, each of these kinds has various degrees, according to the different ways in which the power of nature is surpassed. 
From this it is clear how to reply to the objections, arguing as they do from the divine power. End of question 105. Question 106 of Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, on the Divine Government. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, on the Divine Government, by St. Thomas Aquinas. Translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 106. How one creature moves another. In four articles. We next consider how one creature moves another. This consideration will be threefold. 1. How the angels move, who are purely spiritual creatures. 2. How bodies move. 3. How man moves, who is composed of a spiritual and a corporeal nature. Concerning the first point, there are three things to be considered. 1. How an angel acts on an angel. 2. How an angel acts on a corporeal nature. 3. How an angel acts on man. The first of these raises the question of the enlightenment and speech of the angels, and of their mutual coordination, both of the good and of the bad angels. Concerning their enlightenment, there are four points of inquiry. 1. Whether one angel moves the intellect of another by enlightenment. 2. Whether one angel moves the will of another. 3 whether an inferior angel can enlighten a superior angel, 4. Whether a superior angel enlightens an inferior angel in all that he knows himself. First article. Whether one angel enlightens another. Objection 1. It would seem that one angel does not enlighten another, for the angels possess now the same beatitude which we hope to obtain. But one man will not then enlighten another, according to Jeremiah 31.34, they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother. Therefore neither does an angel enlighten another now. Objection 2. Further, light in the angels is threefold, of nature, of grace, and of glory. But an angel is enlightened in the light of nature by the Creator, in the light of grace by the Justifier, in the light of glory by the Beatifier, all of which comes from God. Therefore one angel does not enlighten another. Objection 3. Further, light is a form in the mind, but the rational mind is informed by God alone, without created intervention, as Augustine says in 83 different questions, question 51. Therefore, one angel does not enlighten the mind of another. On the contrary, Dionysius says, on the heavenly hierarchy 8, that the angels of the second hierarchy are cleansed, enlightened, and perfected by the angels of the first hierarchy. I answer that one angel enlightens another. To make this clear, we must observe that intellectual light is nothing else than a manifestation of truth, according to Ephesians 5.13. All that is made manifest is light. Hence to enlighten means nothing else but to communicate to others the manifestation of the known truth according to the Apostle, Ephesians 3.8. To me, the least of all the saints is given this grace, to enlighten all men, that they may see what is the dispensation of the mystery which hath been hidden from eternity in God. Therefore, one angel is said to enlighten another by manifesting the truth which he knows himself. Hence, Dionysius says, on the heavenly hierarchy 7, Theologians plainly show that the orders of the heavenly beings are taught divine science by the higher minds. Now, since two things concur in the intellectual operation, as we've said in question 105, article 3, namely the intellectual power and the likeness of the thing understood, in both of these one angel can notify the known truth to another. First, by strengthening his intellectual power, for just as the power of an imperfect body is strengthened by the neighborhood of a more perfect body, for instance, the less hot is made hotter by the presence of what is hotter, so the intellectual power of an inferior angel is strengthened by the superior angel turning to him. Since in spiritual things, for one thing to turn to another corresponds to neighborhood in corporeal things. Secondly, 
one angel manifests the truth to another as regards the likeness of the thing understood for the superior angel receives the knowledge of truth by a kind of universal conception to receive which the inferior angel's intellect is not sufficiently powerful for it is natural to him to receive the truth in a more particular manner therefore the superior angel distinguishes in a way the truth which he conceives universally so that it can be grasped by the inferior angel and thus he proposes it to his knowledge thus it is with us that the teacher in order to adapt himself to others divides into many points the knowledge which he possesses in the universal this is thus expressed by dionysius on the heavenly hierarchy fifteen every intellectual substance with provident power divides and multiplies the uniform knowledge bestowed on it by one nearer to god so as to lead its inferiors upwards by analogy reply to objection one all the angels both inferior and superior see the essence of god immediately and in this respect one does not teach another it is of this truth that the prophet speaks wherefore he adds they shall teach no more every man his brother saying know the lord for all shall know me from the least of them even to the greatest but all the types of the divine works which are known in god as in their cause god knows in himself because he comprehends himself but of others who see god each one knows the more types the more perfectly he sees god hence a superior angel knows more about the types of the divine works than an inferior angel and concerning these the former enlightens the latter and as to this dionysius says divine names four that the angels are enlightened by the types of existing things reply to objection two an angel does not enlighten another by giving him the light of nature grace or glory but by strengthening his natural light and by manifesting to him the truth concerning the state of nature of grace and of glory as explained above reply to objection three the rational mind is formed immediately by god either as the image from the exemplar for as much as it is made to the image of god alone or as the subject by the ultimate perfecting form for the created mind is always considered to be unformed except it adhere to the first truth while the other kinds of enlightenment that proceed from man or angel are as it were dispositions to this ultimate form second article whether one angel moves another angel's will objection one it would seem that one angel can move another angel's will because according to dionysius quoted above article one as one angel enlightens another so does he cleanse and perfect another but cleansing and perfecting seem to belong to the will for the former seems to point to the stain of sin which appertains to the will while to be perfected is to obtain an end which is the object of the will therefore an angel can move another angel's will objection two further as dionysius says on the heavenly hierarchy seven the names of the angels designate their properties now the seraphim are so called because they kindle or give heat and this is by love which belongs to the will therefore one angel moves another angel's will objection three further the philosopher says on the soul three eleven that the higher appetite moves the lower but as the intellect of the superior angel is higher so also is his will it seems therefore that the superior angel can change the will of another angel on the contrary to him it belongs to change the will to whom it belongs to bestow righteousness for righteousness is the rightness of the will but god alone bestows righteousness therefore one angel cannot change another angel's will i answer that as was said above question 105 article 4 the will is changed in two ways on the part of the object and on the part of the power on the part of the object both the good itself which is the object of the will moves the will as the appetible moves the appetite and he who points out the object as for instance one who proves something to be good but as we've said above question 105 article 4 other goods in a measure incline the will yet nothing sufficiently moves the will save the universal good and that is god and this good he alone shows that it may be seen by the blessed 
who, when Moses asked, Show me thy glory, answered, I will show thee all good. Exodus 33.18.19 Therefore, an angel does not move the will sufficiently, either as the object or as showing the object. But he inclines the will as something lovable, and as manifesting some created good ordered to God's goodness. And thus he can incline the will to the love of the creature or of God by way of persuasion. But on the part of the power, the will cannot be moved at all save by God. For the operation of the will is a certain inclination of the willer to the thing willed. And he alone can change this inclination who bestowed on the creature the power to will, just as that agent alone can change the natural inclination which can give the power to which follows that natural inclination. Now God alone gave to the creature the power to will, because he alone is the author of the intellectual nature. Therefore an angel cannot move another angel's will. Reply to Objection 1. Cleansing and perfecting are to be understood according to the mode of enlightenment. And since God enlightens by changing the intellect and will, he cleanses by removing defects of intellect and will, and perfects unto the end of the intellect and will. But the enlightenment caused by an angel concerns the intellect, as explained above, answer 1. Therefore an angel is to be understood as cleansing from the defect of nescience in the intellect, and as perfecting unto the consummate end of the intellect, and this is the knowledge of truth. Thus Dionysius says, the Ecclesiastical Hierarchy 6, that in the heavenly hierarchy the chastening of the inferior essence is an enlightening of things unknown that leads them to more perfect knowledge. For instance, we might say that corporeal sight is cleansed by the removal of darkness, enlightened by the diffusion of light, and perfected by being brought to the perception of the colored object. Reply to Objection 2. One angel can induce another to love God by persuasion, as explained above. Reply to Objection 3. The philosopher speaks of the lower sensitive appetite, which can be moved by the superior intellectual appetite, because it belongs to the same nature of the soul, and because the inferior appetite is a power in a corporeal organ. But this does not apply to the angels. Third article. Whether an inferior angel can enlighten a superior angel. Objection 1. It would seem that an inferior angel can enlighten a superior angel, for the ecclesiastical hierarchy is derived from and represents the heavenly hierarchy, and hence the heavenly Jerusalem is called our mother, Galatians 4.26. But in the church, even superiors are enlightened and taught by their inferiors, as the apostle says, 1 Corinthians 14.31 You may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be exhorted. Therefore, likewise in the heavenly hierarchy, the superiors can be enlightened by inferiors. Objection 2. Further, as the order of corporeal substances depends on the will of God, so also does the order of spiritual substances. But, as was said above, Question 105, Article 6. God sometimes acts outside the order of corporeal substances. Therefore, he also sometimes acts outside the order of spiritual substances, by enlightening inferior otherwise than through their superiors. Therefore, in that way the inferiors, enlightened by God, can enlighten superiors. Objection 3. Further, one angel enlightens the other to whom he turns, as was above explained, Article 1. But since this turning to another is voluntary, the highest angel can turn to the lowest passing over the others. Therefore, he can enlighten him immediately, and thus the latter can enlighten his superiors. On the contrary, Dionysius says that this is the divine unalterable law, that inferior things are led to God by the superior. On the heavenly hierarchy 4, the ecclesiastical hierarchy 5. I answer that the inferior angels never enlighten the superior, but are always enlightened by them. The reason is because, as above explained, question 105, article 6, one order is under another, 
as cause is under cause. And hence, as cause is order to cause, so is order to order. Therefore there is no incongruity, if sometimes anything is done outside the order of the inferior cause, to be ordered to the superior cause, as in human affairs the command of the president is passed over from obedience to the prince. So it happens that God works miraculously outside the order of corporeal nature, that men may be ordered to the knowledge of him. But the passing over of the order that belongs to spiritual substances in no way belongs to the ordering of men to God, since the angelic operations are not made known to us, as are the operations of sensible bodies. Thus the order which belongs to spiritual substances is never passed over by God, so that the inferiors are always moved by the superior, and not conversely. Reply to Objection 1. The ecclesiastical hierarchy imitates the heavenly in some degree, but not by a perfect likeness. For in the heavenly hierarchy the perfection of the order is in the proportion to its nearness to God, so that those who are the nearer to God are the more sublime in grade, and more clear in knowledge. And on that account the superiors are never enlightened by the inferiors, whereas in the ecclesiastical hierarchy sometimes those who are the nearer to God in sanctity are, the, are in the lowest grade, and are not conspicuous for science. And some are also eminent in one kind of science and fail in another, and on that account superiors may be taught by inferiors. Reply to Objection 2. As above explained, there is no similarity between what God does outside the order of corporeal nature and that of spiritual nature. Hence, the argument does not hold. Reply to Objection 3. An angel turns voluntarily to enlighten another angel, but the angel's will is ever regulated by the divine law which made the order in the angels. Fourth article. Whether the superior angel enlightens the inferior as regards all he himself knows. Objection 1. It would seem that the superior angel does not enlighten the inferior concerning all he himself knows, for Dionysius says, on the heavenly hierarchy 12, that the superior angels have a more universal knowledge, and the inferior a more particular and individual knowledge. But more is contained under a universal knowledge than under a particular knowledge. Therefore, not all that the superior angels know is known by the inferior, though these being enlightened by the former. Objection 2. Further, the master of the sentences, 2 D. 11, says that the superior angels had long known the mystery of the incarnation, whereas the inferior angels did not know it until it was accomplished. Thus we find that on some of the angels inquiring, as it were, in ignorance, who is this king of glory, other angels who knew answered, The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory, as Dionysius expounds on the heavenly hierarchy 7. But this would not apply if the superior angels enlighten the inferior concerning all they know themselves. Therefore, they do not do so. Objection 3. Further, if the superior angels enlighten the inferior about all they know, nothing that the superior angels know would be unknown to the inferior angels. Therefore, the superior angels could communicate nothing more to the inferior, which appears open to objection. Therefore, the superior angels enlighten the inferior in all things. On the contrary, Gregory, Peter Lombard, Sentences 2, D. 9, see Gregory, Homily 34 on the Gospels, says, In that heavenly country, though there are some excellent gifts, yet nothing is held individually. And Dionysius says, Each heavenly essence communicates to the inferior the gift derived from the superior. On the heavenly hierarchy, 15 as quoted above, Article 1. I answer that every creature participates in the divine goodness, so as to diffuse the good it possesses to others, for it is of the nature of good to communicate itself to others. Hence also corporeal agents give their likeness to others, so far as they can. So the more an agent is established in the share of the divine goodness, so much the more does it strive to transmit its perfections to others as far as possible. Hence the blessed Peter admonishes those who by grace share in the divine goodness, saying, 
as every man hath received grace ministering the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of god first peter four ten much more therefore do the holy angels who enjoy the plenitude of participation of the divine goodness impart the same to those below them nevertheless this gift is not received so excellently by the inferior as by the superior angels, and therefore the superior ever remain in a higher order, and have a more perfect knowledge, as the master understands the same thing better than the pupil who learns from him. Reply to Objection 1. The knowledge of the superior angels is said to be more universal as regards the more eminent mode of knowledge. Reply to Objection 2. The master's words are not to be understood as if the inferior angels were entirely ignorant of the mystery of the Incarnation, but that they did not know it as fully as the superior angels, and that they progressed in the knowledge of it afterwards when the mystery was accomplished. Reply to Objection 3. Till the Judgment Day, some new things are always being revealed by God to the highest angels concerning the course of the world, and especially the salvation of the elect. Hence, there is always something for the superior angels to make known to the inferior. End of question 106